Welcome to Product Mastery Now, where we simplify the seven knowledge areas for product mastery. These are the product management practices that elevate your influence and create products your customers love. To see all seven areas and assess your strengths in product mastery, simply go to my website, that's productmasterynow.com. I'm Chad McAllister, a product management professor, practitioner, and your host. Today, we're talking about product management and innovation of medical products. Now, throughout my career, I've often found that the best insights for improving my work and product actually come from learning from other industries. So even if you're not involved in medical products, you'll be able to apply the practices you're about to hear. And we're gonna learn about the insights for new or improved products, where those come from, along with some of the pitfalls to avoid in getting products launched. We are learning with Ron Richard. He's a seasoned expert specializing in the medical devices, medical diagnostics, and life sciences areas. He has over 35 years of experience in the medical industry, has launched over 40 products, and has 17 patents under his belt. He's also the author of the book, Someday Is Today, which describes how to move from idea to launched, from idea to a launched product. And also, as always, we create a written detailed summary of what we discuss, including a one-page action guide to help you put into action the key concepts that we discuss. You'll find those resources at productmasterynow.com slash 481. This podcast is made possible by the Rapid Product Mastery Experience, that's the RPM experience, which helps product VPs and leaders get their product managers and everyone else contributing to product to increase their performance. Participants build a foundation for higher performance by learning the seven essential product knowledge areas and building trust and collaboration in the process. It's not like other training. To see how it's unique and how it can help you, go to productmasterynow.com slash RPM. Ron, I'm delighted you can be here. I'm really looking forward to hearing from your vast experience developing products. Yeah, thank you for the invita invitation, Chad. Nice to meet you. Likewise. I'm first curious just about the path, right? So we all have our paths into product and we come from different areas, but specifically medical products. How, how did you get your start in that? Through my experience as a respiratory therapist, I worked hmm. in a teaching hospital for a number of years in various parts of the hospital, intensive care in particular, where patients are often on a ventilator and they're intubated. They have a tube down there airway to you know keep them breathing and it's frustrating trying to communicate with patients because they can't talk you, you, you right. lose your ability to speak so the first product i invented i'll just show it here, here to you really quickly was this communication board which has very simple phrases on it and information that a patient can just point to and say right. i need a drink of water I, I mm -hmm. have pain and uh, different things like that. So they could communicate with the doctors, the nurses, their family, uh, even though they didn't have the ability to speak. So that was my first invention. And it was written up in a national uh, respiratory care magazine as quite, a, quite an innovation. And it took me about three or four months. I didn't really have any idea how to develop a product, but you know, I saw a problem and then I came up with a solution yeah. and I, that's a big part of my book. It's problem, solution, problem, solution. It's almost like playing ping pong. And eventually through trial and error and interviewing patients who eventually got off of the ventilator and asking them, did that help? And it was almost like a hundred percent. It's like, I am so glad somebody had something like that to help me uh, talk to the staff and my family. Yeah, so but... that was product number one. <clears throat> I'm also a paramedic, and I worked on an ambulance. And back in the day, you would pick up people at their home or somewhere from a car accident, and you would put them on oxygen, and you'd put the oxygen cylinder, believe it or not, right between their legs on the gurney mm -hmm. and transport them into the ambulance. So I thought, this is not very comfortable, and it's not very safe. So I went to like a Home Depot store, and I bought some PVC tubing that was the size of an oxygen cylinder, put some straps on the bottom of the cart, and I made my own oxygen cylinder holder. Well, that eventually got sold to a large, actually the company that makes the gurneys that are transporting mm -hmm. patients even still today, and that product's still in use today. So another problem solution example there. So that's how I kind of got started into inventing and making products in the medical field. Yeah, just being aware, observing where there's some current issues, 
And what <coughs> might we do to try to solve these problems? And I love the simple problem solution approach that, that relates to all my experience in product work as well identify a problem and move on from there. Um, and you probably have some other good examples for us too, because you've developed you know 40 products to help medical professionals over your career. And you certainly have helped other medical companies and medical professionals work on their stuff. You've given them insights as well. C can we talk a little bit more about, those were two great examples about finding insights, finding ideas. W what else comes up for you when it comes to, you know, kind of the skills involved for discovering the, those problems that exist? Uh, be open-minded, uh, hmm. be, be attentive to uh, what's going on in your surroundings. And, and I always use the term live in the moment, you know, because when you're dealing with critical issues with patients that are sick, you can oftentimes get distracted or get pulled into certain things. But for me, I've had the ability to stay in the moment and stay focused on looking at how to not only take care of the patient and work with the clinical team, but also observe what products they're using, and I've always been fascinated and interested in technology. So that's what's led me to on a path of being able to successfully create all these products, which resulted in sales to date to about one and a half billion dollars. That's a lot of sales. Okay, so be open-minded and attentive, live in the moment. But it uh, sounds like also you know, have that mindset that I'm purposely observing other issues that might occur here. How can we simplify things for the patient maybe, right? Or improve things mm -hmm. for the medical practitioner and the like. I kind of see those as the two big stakeholders. There's no doubt others involved, but we got the patient and we got the person providing the medical care. When we think about the patient, you know, and getting insights about what's going on with the patient, I don't know, maybe you have, have another example or two you can share with us, but I'm thinking about, you know, what role really does the patient play when it comes to, you know, developing new products? Mm -hmm. Well, it used to be easier before we got all these regulations and standards and FDA mm -hmm. things in place to actually talk to patients. And uh, now it's a little bit form more formalized with HIPAA and, and so on and so forth. But that would be the first step that I would take uh, typically in developing products. We would come up with a, a platform or a base idea. And then the next step would be to go out and interview patients and kind of just talk in general terms through a PowerPoint or uh, show them a little prototype and get their feedback. And in, mm -hmm. in particular, I work a lot with respiratory patients and also people that have sleep apnea. <clears throat> and a good example that I could share with you is that many years ago when people started using CPAP, which is a, a way to keep your airway open through a mask and a machine with a hose attached to it, the masks were very clunky and very hard to uh, put on and, and seat, and you'd have to really tighten them up, and it would kind of make a crease on your nose and a red welt around your face. So that was problems that I saw right away with patients. And then the solution would be, how can we make this more comfortable? How can we make this easier to use? And through my experience at ResMed, we developed some of the most world-class, very comfortable masks that you could ever imagine. And so that really advanced the whole field of sleep apnea because if you don't, if, if it's not comfortable, the patient isn't going to wear it or they're not going to use it, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. And I've seen the, those pictures <clears throat> and they look very uncomfortable, right, to have this mask and trying to improve that is like the <clears throat> obvious thing to do. How can we make this better for the patient? You or anyone listening, maybe you can help the dental profession because when I go to the dentist, the thing that annoys me the most is when they're working on, you know, what, whatever in, inside the mouth and their fingers push my lip over my tooth and I, I leave the, the dental office with a sore inside my mouth just because they were rubbing my lip across the tooth. Like, yeah. Maybe we could stop that easily. There, there's a good insight for someone. <laughs> okay, Absolutely. So, I think you just gave somebody an idea. <clears throat> I hope so. I'm hoping it makes it to the market so my dentist can use it, who's very good, by the way, but that's beside the point. Okay, so that, that, that's a, you know, a good observation there, right? The, the mask being uncomfortable, you went on to improve that. Talking to patients, right? Interviewing our customers is a key aspect of what we do as product people. And he said, you know, maybe talking over a PowerPoint, over a, a mock-up to convey this, or even a, a prototype. What, what's been your experience with prototypes that you might put together for a patient? I don't know what we're talking about, like, you know, foam and cardboard or how you approach this. Yeah, I've, I've used all kinds of different materials to uh, develop prototypes. Uh, foam is a good one. Uh, foam sheets, uh, cardboard, mm -hmm. I've used that. Um, some 
rapid prototyping with uh, plastics. But now, you know, for inventors and for people that I work with, uh, I'm telling you, these 3D printers are fantastic. Yeah. Uh, you can make all different sizes and, and shapes of things as long as you've got a decent CAD drawing and you've got the engineering aspects and all the <clears throat> those kinds of things put together. The 3D printers now are amazing. In fact, you mentioned something earlier about uh, my book. is It's pretty focused on medical stuff, but I'm working on a project now using the same framework of my book, but with a guy who's a meteorologist, and we're developing a whole new idea for a rain gauge. And uh -huh. we're using 3D rapid prototyping. We're doing testing in all kinds of different weather right now because the, there's a lot of storms going on. We're getting some really great data and some good results. But So a lot of the stuff that I, I do and have done, it can apply to a number of different fields. Yeah, absolutely. The innovation process, this process that we go through in product management of finding a problem, coming up with possible solutions, validating that you know what's the right solution, ultimately developing that, getting to market. It's the same across industries, right? And that's why it's so valuable to hear from someone like you with deep experience. And now you're even extending your process to you know other domains too. Yeah. Early on in my product development career, I was pretty fortunate. I had a mentor who... Um, sent me to Detroit and I attended a week-long workshop. It was called the House of Quality and it was jointly mm -hmm. put on and uh, conducted by Ford and by Toyota. And I noticed something through the class. It was kind of interesting. I noticed that the Ford engineers were very Teutonic and the way they approached developing uh, products was a little different than the Japanese. The Japanese seemed to develop from a, a, an aspect of, I'm curious about this, so I'm going to talk to uh, car owners and drivers and what's the experience and they were really into getting customer feedback and then go out and try to develop something that the customer was going to go wow this is fantastic I love this car and so that's what I took away from there and that's kind of what I've put into my medical career is that Toyota <clears throat> Lexus sort of approach to let's make the customer exceedingly happy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And engage the customer. Yeah. House of Quality, yeah. the specific tool that a lot of people might know is the quality function deployment using the House of Quality yep. diagram. UFD. Exactly. QFD. And great tool for bridging, you know, kind of what the customer wants to what engineering needs to know to develop a solution. And it's used a lot in automotive settings. I appreciate you mentioning that too. So we, we, you were talking about the what you just said made me think a little bit. There are some organizations that tend to develop products from their own experience and they're less engaged with customers, right? So we started this, you know, recognizing a problem a customer has, a patient has. But where does the medical practitioner kind of play in this too? As, as you've helped a lot of medical practitioners and, and with your book certainly take their ideas, their insights and, and develop that into something. What is their role? And let's start there. I have a Second part, I'll follow up with in a minute. Sure. Yeah, so the the driving force behind the book that I wrote was actually from a lecture I did at Stanford. I was invited there by the dean of the School of Business, and he asked me, he knew me through my relationship with some other people there on the campus. That's where my wife graduated from medical school as well. So he said, would you come out and do a talk about product development invention to our doctors? And I go, well, that's interesting. He goes, these doctors here, they have a lot of good ideas, but they don't know how to get them out, you know, out to the market, how to come. They didn't go to school to be uh, you know, entrepreneurs or inventors. And I said, sure, I'd be happy to do that, Bob. So I did the, the talk, and afterwards a lot of doctors came up and said, uh, man, I have these great ideas, and I just can't get them out of my coffee cup. You know, they're just kind of stuck there. You know, how, what's the next step? How do I take that? So that's a big part of the book. But to answer your question, I feel like clinicians are the best inventors because they're at first hand, you know, right at the coal face of this is what I'm using. It doesn't really work. It works, but it doesn't work that well or it could be improved. And that's a big part of my book. Always be curious, always challenge what you're using or what you're doing, and try to see where there could be improvements made to ultimately improve outcomes in patient care. So what we're driving towards is actually reducing healthcare costs, innovation, you know, be innovative and try to be developing things that are patient focused, patient centric, patient first. And so that's where the clinician and the patient kind of marriage product development has always existed in, at least in my ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I like the patient first 
part that we should be focused on our customer and trying to solve their problem right in a way that creates as much value as we can for them. I'm curious, though, also, as you have seen the clinicians maybe pursuing some idea, maybe in your own experience too, in organizations, we can sometimes have this more inside view where we maybe over time, we think we have a better idea of what the customer needs than the customer actually needs, right? And it's not that we're trying to ask the customer to design something for us. That doesn't usually go very well for us. But if we understand the problem deeply, we usually do a better job. But I've seen organizations lose track of even that, of kind of knowing what the problems are that the, you know, the customer's unmet needs right now, not having good insights in that, or maybe even being arrogant and feeling like they know better (laughs) that like that. And I imagine this happens in your role too, that the medical practitioner, you know, says, well, I know how this should be and maybe discounts the, the patient's perspective in that. Thoughts? Yeah, there's there's a constant balance that needs to be created inside of a company in the culture. You've got the engineers who don't really have medical backgrounds that are designing and developing things. Then you have the people inside. If you have a good company, a balance of maybe nurses, respiratory therapists, or key opinion leaders like doctors that you bring in and you put them on a panel and you sit there and talk. Now, the thing that you just said that I've seen happen, and this is why products oftentimes, they slip the timelines, they fail. It's the arrogance inside the organization of someone in senior management saying, oh, we don't need to, we don't need to uh, talk to patients or we don't need to talk, talk to doctors. We've been doing this for so long. We know exactly what to do and we're just going to move forward because speed to market is the thing. You know, we, the longer we take, the more money we spend. It's two times longer. It's four times more expensive, you know, all these formulas they have. And then they end up coming out with an inferior product at the end of the day. So it's pretty much much one of these things that I've learned over time. It's better to mm-hmm. go slow and make sure you've got all your, you know, I's dotted, your T's crossed, and you're getting the input from the right people, and you're getting enough input to make good decisions to move forward with the product. It's a phase gate kind of a, approach. Right. Yeah, there, there's tension there, obviously, right? There, there's pressure. The sooner we can get the product into the market, the sooner we have the opportunity to make revenue. But yep. if it's not the product that people really are going to buy, you know, that, that we're just shooting ourselves in the head by moving forward quickly. So going slow is good advice to actually know that you're solving a problem that needs to be solved in a way that people care about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, otherwise okay. you're just going to... What I my experience is if you have a real strong personality, let's say in a product development group that's an alpha male, alpha female, whatever, and they're just like totally hell-bent on, we're getting this thing done in a year, uh, let's disregard all the upfront stuff to really build what I call the solid platform to move forward with. Uh, you end up making mistakes, and what you end up doing is launching products that are version one, and then about six months later, oh, here comes version two. You know, it's like the new and improved version. And then by, you know, year and a half out, you're on version four. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a friend I did some work with that told me about a product manager in their organization who at least he was upfront and saying, well, I, I don't like talking to customers because I end up ignoring what they say anyhow. Um, and I just you know, basically want to do it the way I think it should be done. Our customers provide useful insights, <laughs> so we should be engaged oh, with absolutely. them. <laughs> absolutely. But you've got to be You've got to be patient, tolerant, be willing to travel and go yep. around and talk to people and develop uh, relationships. You know, I always use no like trust. You know, hmm. do, does, some, does somebody know me? If they don't, maybe you should get to know me so we can work together in the common go, go, good of helping patients. And then after they get to know me, they kind of like me. You know, I'm, I'm not a bad person. If they like you, then you've moved to the last step in your relationship or the, you know, a final kind of really super solid part and that's I trust you and mm-hmm. that means I trust to share information with you I trust that what you, what I'm saying is meaningful you're listening you're taking that information back and ultimately it's going to help patients yeah absolutely it's good okay let's talk about some of the uh, pitfalls or mistakes that uh, maybe you've made you've seen others make in going from this, you know, insight observation, that this is a bad place for this oxygen cylinder to be, right? We should do something different, to getting that product launched. Because it's not always a clear path, right? Tell us about some of those mistakes and maybe what you've learned from those mistakes, whether you made them or others. 
Well, you must know my background because I've had a <laughs> lot of successes, but in, in doing so, I've had a lot of failures as well. I know product I've learned, actually, <laughs> I've learned more from my failures, Chad, than I have mm-hmm. really from my successes, to be honest. And it's it's been humbling. So I'll just real quickly uh, tell you a couple things. One is called feature creep. Mm. So feature creep is something when, you know, this is the danger of going out and talking to customers and talking to different people who are influencers or KOLs. They may have various different opinions about how to clinically approach a a disease or a problem or a diagnosis and whatever. And that person may hold high esteem within your organization. It's like, well, we need to do what Dr. X said. And then the rest of the doctors just ignore them. It's like, no, you got to blend all this information together. So what you can happen is you've got people inside the company that have so much respect for Dr. X. We're going down there, this road, and we're going to develop the Dr. X product. And Dr. X represents only a very small percentage of the total buying you know, population or the market. So you have to be careful about displeasing one customer. Mm-hmm. you got to have products that can sell more germanely across the board to to treat you know the, the diseases or the problems that are out there so the feature creep is one thing you've got to watch out for and that means people coming back to you when you're getting fairly far along into the the pro- product plan and they'll come back and say well if you could only do this and then they just think oh it's so easy it's like flipping a light switch no if you only could make this thing go up to 100 liters a minute in gas flow oh that would be fantastic and then you ask them a question well how many patients do you actually think need 100 liters a minute in in gas flow oh i I had maybe one or two patients last year that could really have benefited from (laughs) from that but if it gets into the you know into the DNA of the company. It's like Dr. X said that. So now the engineers have to go back and, you know, rejigger this whole platform in it. What happens is it just stretches the timeline out. And then that's when you burn more money, more time. And then you got the problem of, I've had key engineers over time say, I don't like working here anymore. I'm leaving. And then you have another problem to solve. So feature creeps, another one problem. The other is changes in reimbursement. So you can go to market Mm -hmm. thinking you've got a really solid idea here. It fits into this certain reimbursement HICPIC code or ICD-9 or ICD-10. And then all of a sudden, every year, things kind of change. And just for instance, I was working on a project and reimbursement was at this rate. And then all of a sudden, the next year was 50% less. Well, we had based our cost of goods on that reimbursement rate. And when it got... <clears throat> jump down 50% from what it was, we had to go back and start to think, well, can the market actually afford to buy this product and what's the ROI on it? You know, it used to be the ROI was maybe nine months and now it's going to be double. <clears throat> so those are some things, Chad, that, you know, you've got to look at that can affect your, you know, your product launch. Yeah, absolutely. Those are good. The If we have any risk of the revenue changing, we should be aware of that. And that's just built into medical because of the reimbursement issue. Yeah, I was going to add on the most recent project I'm working on now is a heated high flow therapy device that works in the hospital uh, for people that have COVID and COPD. Well, two years ago, the FDA came up with a whole new idea based on some buddy PhD inside the organization that wanted to change the standards for biocompatibility toxicology leachability testing and apply it to permanent implants but it was for disposable respiratory tubing so we had to go Mm. back to a bunch of testing labs and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and at the end of the day all it's done is just there's no tubing that can actually pass a permanent implant standard is what we've come up with so you're faced with either getting an ombudsman or an attorney or having a face-to-face with the FDA and saying, this is unreasonable. We can't launch right. a product like this. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. Industries that are heavily regulated have extra issues they have to think about for sure. I, I appreciate the Dr. X point as well and reminded me earlier in my career, there was a doctor who became very well known because of who he treated that was very well known. And he had a pers- a approach to diagnosing things and he somehow ended up with our company at the time and we were helping him create a system for that and we were all really excited about this only to find out later that as you said earlier you know maybe there's other doctor xyz's that don't have the same approach and that what we might be following is actually the minority approach 
and mm-hmm. we ended up not going anywhere just because we couldn't find others that would really accept this approach well. So, yeah, it, that's why it's good to get a, a broader, right, broader audience in terms of, and then document that, and then take it back to your senior managers and go through all of the comments and all of the information you've collected from both patients and from clinicians. Mm-hmm. Yeah, once again, involve your involved holders, have that broad perspective. It's really good. Okay. I feel like I've learned a lot just talking with you about the, you know, development of medical products, really simple things like just observations, right? The, the need for the, the patient on the trach to be able to communicate, right? The oxygen cylinder, just observing the work that goes on and talking to the people involved with the, their end customer, right? In this medical space, but talking to people who know the end customer well and have done observations too, really good insights to be gained from them. And thanks for sharing some of the headaches that can occur down the road too as we are developing. As listeners know, we do like innovation quotes around here. What do you have for us? And if you can, share what that means to you. Yeah, so I'll, the Stanford lecture I did, actually, this is where I got the quote that's on my the front of my books. The, the title is Someday is Today. That, 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 mean, that stimulates take action. But mm-hmm. the doctor I talked to in particular that stuck in my mind, he said, I just can't get my ideas out of my coffee cup. They're sitting there right on my desk. And I go back to my office and I'm looking at that coffee cup and I'm thinking, I know I can make a better mousetrap, you know. And so the quote that I'd share with you is, get your ideas out of your coffee cup and on the market and take mm-hmm. action. I like it. And get your that's when I, 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 I got that from a doctor. And don't let them sit in the coffee cup or whatever cup might they might be sitting in. So, yeah. yeah but I'm sure, Chad, you've talked to people and they'll say, and I've heard this, I don't know how many times at conferences, and I thought of that idea about five years ago, but I never did anything about it. It was so right. simple. You know, I wished I would have taken action. You know, it's like, well, somebody else came up with it too. <laughs> and then they took the trouble and the time and the money to actually launch it. Yeah. Good ideas are relatively easy to come by. It's the execution to take action on them. That's the hard part. You know that. Yep, yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. That's a great quote. Thanks for sharing it with us. Ron, how can people find out more about the work you do, other resources you have, get their hands on your book, anything you want to share with us? Yeah, the title of the book is Someday is Today, and it's under Ron F. Richard. It's on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. And then my website is inventingstartstoday.com. So you Excellent. Can, you can schedule interviews with me or consultations and contact me through my website. Okay. And we will make sure that those links are in the uh, show notes for this as well, the link to your website so that people can contact you, as well as the link to your book. Ron, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Chad. Have a good day. And everyone listening, we will find the written notes of everything we discussed, including that one-page action guide to help you immediately put into action some of the key takeaways that Ron shared with us. Simply go to productmasterynow.com slash 481 uh, to get those resources. As always, everyone, keep innovating. Thank you for listening to Product Mastery Now, where product leaders and managers gain product mastery through practical knowledge, influence, and confidence. By listening, you are becoming a product master, creating products customers love. Find additional resources at productmasterynow.com. Keep innovating.